With nine months of pregnancy wait hanging around after the birth of her baby, a mother may wonder how in the world is she going to get back to her pre-pregnancy weight while taking care of her newborn child. What is a safe amount of weight to lose without compromising a breastfeeding mom's health and milk supply? I'm Leanne Webster, owner of 52 Healthy Weeks, certified personal trainer, a licensed well coach, and a nutritional counselor. Today we're discussing how to lose weight while breastfeeding and maintaining your milk supply. This is The Boob Group, episode 29. Breast milk, it does a baby good. Silly daddy, boobs are for babies. I make milk, what's your superpower? If my breastfeeding offends you, put a blanket over your head. Dairy diva, don't be lactose intolerant. Nursing nature's own breast enhancement. Meals on heels. Whoever said there's no use crying over spilled milk, never had to pump. Breast milk, all udders are inferior. Whatever your point of view, we're here to support your breastfeeding goals. We're the Boob Group, because mothers know breasts. Welcome to the Boob Group, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. I'm your host, Robin Kaplan. I'm also an international board-certified lactation consultant and owner of the San Diego Breastfeeding Center. At the Boob Group, we're your online support group for all things related to breastfeeding. Do you have a favorite episode of the Boob Group? If so, give us a call and tell us why you love it so much. All you have to do is call our hotline at 619-866-4775 and leave a message on our voicemail. We'd love to share it on an upcoming episode. Today, I'm joined by two lovely panelists in the studio. Ladies, will you please introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Lori Schomp. I'm 34 years old and I'm a stay-at-home mom. I have three children. Jack is seven, Abby is four, and Zoe's almost two. Good afternoon. I'm Noreen Ibarra. I'm 36 years old. I also am a stay-at-home mom to Rex Edward, and he is 19 months. Well, welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get started with today's topic, here's Amber McCann talking about the best online breastfeeding resources. Hello, Boob Group listeners. I'm Amber McCann. I'm an international board-certified lactation consultant and the owner of Nourish Breastfeeding Support just outside of Washington, D.C. I'm here to answer some of your most common questions when it comes to finding quality breastfeeding resources online, such as, I think my breasts just don't work. I've tried everything. Have you ever heard of insufficient glandular tissue or hypoplasia? Neither had I until just a few years ago, and I eat, sleep, and breathe breastfeeding. Recently, my good friend and expert on this condition, Diana Kassar Yule, was on a boob group episode called Breastfeeding and Hypoplasia. It's episode number 20 if you want to check it out. Sometimes she says, the boob fairy just didn't arrive. This condition is where a woman's breast didn't develop as they should. It is devastating for many women, and many go through weeks and months after the birth of their babies, trying to figure out why their bodies don't function as they should. But with the power of social media, they are coming together, brainstorming solutions and finding support. I love www.diaryofalactationfailure.blogspot.com. Again, that's www.diaryofalactationfailure.blogspot.com. This blog highlights this condition in a really empowering way. The message is that breastfeeding doesn't have to be all or nothing and that every ounce counts comes through loud and clear. If this sounds like you, you don't have to be alone. Take some time to connect at www.diaryofalactationfailure.blogspot.com. Thank you for listening. I'm Amber McCann, and I'd love for you to check out my website at www.nourishbreastfeeding.com for information on my business and a little bit more about where to get connected with great online breastfeeding support. Or you can join me on my Facebook page at www.facebook.com backslash nourishbreastfeeding. Be sure to listen to the Boob Group each week for more fantastic conversations about breastfeeding and how to find great breastfeeding support. Today on the Boob Group, we're discussing how to lose weight while breastfeeding and maintain your milk supply. Our expert, Leanne Webster, is the owner of 52 Healthy Weeks and a certified personal trainer, licensed well coach, and nutritional counselor. Thanks for joining us, Leanne, and welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Robin. So, Leanne, when is it an appropriate time for a mom with a newborn to begin thinking about losing weight and exercising? Well, she can um, actually begin thinking about it uh, in the hospital, (laughs) Um, but... 
in terms of actually starting to do do something about it, um, I think the most important thing is to get doctor's clearance, um, especially if she's had a C-section. Um, and uh, I think it's also really important for her to actually actively start doing something about it once her milk supply is in and she has a consistent schedule with her baby and she feels like adding in exercise and um, you know paying more attention to what she's eating isn't going to cause added stress in her life. That's a really good point to point out just because obviously establishing a milk supply, establishing a routine with a newborn um, can be a little bit stressful every once in a while and so <laughs> why add more to the pot essentially? Exactly and and to further answer the question um, I, I think generally speaking a woman can begin walking um, at about two weeks postpartum and um, with a C-section, though, a lot of times, uh, many doctors won't give clearance until about four to six weeks. Yeah. And the amount that they're walking as well. Like, I remember exactly. two weeks postpartum, I decided to walk a little bit further than around the block. Right. And, oh, I was paying for it. Yes. Just in pain. Yes. Not, not necessarily milk supply, yes. but in pain afterwards. So. And, and I actually paid for it in milk supply because back when my son was a newborn, I did not have a lactation consultant, and um, I really didn't know. So... It would have made a huge difference for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, Leanne, about how many calories a day does a mom need to consume to maintain a healthy milk supply? Well, they've done a lot of studies on this. And um, what they've found is that when, regardless of a woman's height or weight or age, when her calories drop below 1,500, then her milk supply starts to decrease. So the um, the recommendation is to... De- decrease your calories no more than 15 to 20 percent of your daily caloric need. But if that ends up being, so let's say your daily caloric need was 1,700 and you decreased it by 15 percent, you're going to drop below 1,500. So you got to make sure that it stays above 1,500. Okay, okay. And I've heard also that about one pound a week is safe for a, um, a safe weight for a mom to lose while she's breastfeeding. And so, and you kind of alluded to this, why why is it not a good idea to lose weight too quickly? Okay, so in order to lose a pound a week, you have to have a caloric deficit or enough exercise going on that you've got your, your um, 500 calories below your daily caloric need. That's a lot. And that is going to take most women below 1,500 calories a day. So that means their milk supply is probably going to decrease. So it's probably a little bit safer to actually um, try to go for about a half a pound a week. And um, I think the key really is to develop consistent habits, nourish your body, and make sure you're getting enough sleep. And then the, the right, that those things will fall into place and then the weight will start to come off. But if you don't establish the habits and you just, you know, think constantly about, oh, I got to, I got to lose that weight. I got to lose the weight. Your milk supply is going to go down. Yeah. Um, ladies, when did you start thinking about losing your pregnancy weight after your baby was born? Uh, Noreen? Um, I think the most exciting part about breastfeeding was that 20 pounds came off in the first before you get clearance to exercise, I mean, I got the clearance, but in my head, I was like, what does it matter? I just lost 20 pounds. <laughs> so um, that was really great for my self-esteem because you're worried about it. Your body's doing things it's never done before. And, you know, if you're a first time mom um, in your life and um, and then it was just I wanted to make sure I got out of the house. I'm a stay at home mom. And so um, I took walks all the time and it was good just to learn to how to transport your child, whether I started wearing him or just in the stroller or how to time, you know, with breastfeeding and personally eating, um, how to get out the door in a stroller with or without a dog kind of thing. So um, I started losing weight immediately after because I was breastfeeding. And so that helped with um, trying to figure out what my body is saying and doing. And um, so I, I was thinking about it immediately and I was walking immediately. How about you, Lori? I think it was because each of my deliveries were so different, it depended with each one of them. Um, my first ch- my first son was a completely uncomplicated C-section, and within six weeks I was walking and, and, and seriously losing a significant amount of weight. With my second child, um, I had a VBAC with her. It was fantastic. Within, I don't know, a week, 
we were doing a good amount of walking and probably by the end of that month I was running again. And then with my third child, I had a um, emergency section that resulted in um, a significant um, infection. Um, oh, so it was eight and a half months before that wow. wound was, was um, fully healed. So there was a lot of time where it was like, gosh, I just want to go to a yoga class and go for a run. And it just wasn't a possibility for me at that point. Um, but I think the th one of the the keys for me is I have a body that holds on to weight as long as I'm lactating. And as soon as I'm no longer lactating, I lose a significant amount of weight. So for me, it's important to remain as active as I can, knowing that ultimately whenever the weaning process does happen, that weight will just come off very, very easily. That's a really good point. We were talking about this in um, a Preggy Pals episode about... Um, even though you burn about 300 to 500 calories a day while you're breastfeeding, some women drop it off and, you know, and they weigh less than they did before they were pregnant. And then other women tend to hold on to it until they wean. And so it's definitely kind of seeing how your body holds on to all of this. Yeah, it was only that one, my, my oldest weaned before the pregnancy of my second child. And I lost like 40 pounds in two months. <laughs> <laughs> People were like, oh my gosh, are you okay? And I was like, no, just all that weight I was holding on to finally went as soon as he weaned. But I haven't had a wean since then, so I became pregnant with my second child, and I've been nursing consecutively since then. So, um, ultimately, when Zoe weans, the weight will go. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, Leanne, what recommendations do you have to eating enough calories but still supporting weight loss? Okay, so um, I think the the main thing is to eat nourishing calories. And I know it's very difficult as a new mom or a lactating mom to... Um, because you've already got so much going on to, to, you know, spend the time to cook and and do things that are really nourishing. Um, so some things that I recommend that are really easy, fruits and vegetables, nuts. Nuts are a great source of protein. And um, walnuts in particular are very high in omega-3 fatty acids, which are very important, especially for a nursing mom. Um, beans. Beans are very easy. Just open a can of organic beans if you don't have the time to make them yourself. And um, oatmeal is another good one. So I think that the key is to focus on on nourishing foods and also to, to make the time each week, even if it's, you know, 30 minutes to organize your refrigerator and make a list of what it is you want to eat during the week and what you need to have on hand. Because, yeah. That's such an important thing. It's one of the things that I've done in the past year or so is that and my kids are uh, they're older you know five and seven but um still on before I go shopping Sunday morning for some of the stuff that we're going to use for school that week I sit down and think about what what I want to cook that week and a lot of it I actually cook Sunday afternoon because it's mellow no one's really doing anything especially in football season everyone's watching football it's totally fine but I find that I can make you know a spaghetti sauce, some chili, some, you know, some other things that I actually can use throughout the rest of the week that I don't have to think about when I'm rushing home, bringing my kids home from school. And, and also when my kids were younger, my crock pot was totally my best friend as well, because it was just one of those things that warm, nourishing foods at night that I didn't really have to think about at four o'clock in the afternoon. Exactly. And I think also the crock pot is a great thing to use because you're almost guaranteed to have leftovers. And for a mom that's nursing and just really, really busy, just knowing that you can go into the refrigerator and have something nourishing on hand for lunch or for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, you can have chicken chicken noodle soup three times a day if that's what you need to do. Um, but having that on hand is, is everything, really. So, Leanne, um, what, what are your favorite go-to meals, like for breakfast, lunch, dinner, some s snacks? You mentioned nuts, things like that. But sure. What, what are some easy things that moms can kind of just grab and, and eat that are, or, or make very easily? Okay. Um, uh, one of the, the quickest, easiest things, and in fact, I did it this morning. I just took um, a, a cup of blueberries, a yogurt. Um, always, you always want to look at sugar, try to keep the sugar low in yogurt, um, and some very natural granola. I particularly like um, the Bare Naked brand. They sell it at Target. The sugar is only four grams a serving. And just, just mix that together and you've got yourself a yogurt parfait. You've got great calcium. You've got um, great uh, great fruits from the, the blueberries. And um, you've got yourself a really healthy meal for breakfast. Um, there are uh, some instant oatmeals if if you just don't have time that are fairly low in sugar when you're looking at the ingredients they'll make sure they don't have aspartame or anything that's artificial 
Um, you can also make oatmeal the night before in the crock pot with, um, with uh, walnuts and apples. Just throw that in the crock pot with a little bit of cinnamon. It takes less than 10 minutes to prepare, and then you've got a nourishing breakfast. Um, as far as lunch ideas go, um, I would say a, a bean and cheese burrito. Super easy, super healthy. Um, if you happen to be gluten-free, um, then go with corn tortillas, black beans, tomatoes, avocado, a little bit of cheese. You've got yourself a really healthy, easy lunch. Um, and then as far as dinner goes, um, uh, just sautéed vegetables with um, chicken or uh, uh, wild-caught salmon, which is very high in omega-3s. Fajitas are great if um, if you are looking to, you know, spice things up and, and add in um, more vegetables. Okay. And what about some snacks that are easy to go to? Um, I always like to make my own trail mix. Super easy. Just go to Trader Joe's and... Um, it's better when you make your own because then you can control the ingredients and control the sugar. Um, once again, yogurt is a great snack. Uh, apples and almond butter, great, easy snack. Um, a quick quick uh, snack, just a um, quesadilla with whole wheat tortilla, a little bit of cheese, and lots of vegetables. Um, and I think you bring up a good point, actually. The snacking and the meals... I always tell new moms that the, one of the keys is to eat consistently throughout the day and um, just make sure that you get, uh, you know, a couple hundred calories just every hour to two hours so to keep your metabolism going and to keep your milk supply up. Yeah, we had posted this question on um, our Facebook page for moms to, if they had questions for you, for example. And a lot of them, there was this repeating theme essentially of like, I'm starving or I'm like craving just like cheeseburgers all of the time. And it's like, you know, you f think you just crave through pregnancy. But then, you know, even after the baby's born and especially if you're nursing, you're starving and you're thirsty all the time. And so these snacks can be so beneficial to make sure that you're not you know, plummeting in your sugar levels. Exactly. Exactly. Um, another quick, easy snack, uh, hummus. Um, fresh vegetables, uh, whole grain crackers, and just one of those, you know, Trader Joe's string cheeses. You've got a quick, easy, simple snack. Um, I think the key, once again, is just to plan ahead. Yeah. Ladies, um, what about you? What are your favorite go-to nutritional foods? Noreen? Um, in my family, every time I went to somebody's house, they pushed this stew and it's basically beef shank stew and because it's good for milk supply so one of the things I never hesitated to do anytime somebody said oh hey I'm going to come over visit the baby what can I bring I would tell them a meal um, if they couldn't you know like share a meal go out or whatever like oh you know I'm sure you can't take a baby out you know what can I do have me deliver something to my house or whatever and so that was really that was something that was really important because like it, you're so busy and you know if they ask if they ask what you want, you can be really specific, like get me vegetarian, like chow mein with no MSG, you know, and, <laughs> and it'll happen because they took the time. They obviously care about you and asked. And so that was one of the things that was really Im important for me to always be open to asking for, you know, my mom would say, oh, what do you want? And I'd be really specific. I want, you know, a do I'm Filipino, so I would say adobo, you know, and that's chicken, you know, a chicken dish. Um, and I always ate throughout like I was just grazing constantly and <laughs> and I was starving and so it was really important for me to eat all the time and all the things you mentioned um, and it's so interesting um, all the things I I just kept shopping the same way I did when I was pregnant if I craved it I I ate it and I just maintain the staple when I was pregnant I was fortunate to crave fruits and vegetables constantly so they were always there and Robin, I've always had this thing when you talk about cooking, all of a sudden I'll get a wild hair up my butt and I'll be like, okay, I need to cook. And everything that's in the fridge, I will put into a dish and it's ready to go. And it might be Wednesday, Sunday or whatever, but my husband will come home and be like, well, who's coming over? And there's literally like, there's no more like loose items. They're, you know, in a stir fry, they're, you know, in lentils and, you know, something else. So, um, all those things, because there is downtime in the beginning as opposed to like now he's 18 months and I'm just chasing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think the most important thing was to ask for help with food. Um, so you don't have to do it because that's part of planning. Um, but also uh, cook when you can. Like 
like Robin mentioned, Mm -hmm. because you have to be, all of a sudden you're starving or you forgot that you didn't eat for a couple hours and you're wondering why you're starving. Exactly. How about you, Lori? What are your favorite go-tos? We also meal plan on Sundays. So we sit, the five of us, um, the kids each choose a meal, my husband chooses meals, things along those lines. So that Sunday morning we go food shopping and we've got a full list of everything that we need for the week. So it's never that like four o'clock in the afternoon, like, oh God, they have to eat again. (laughs) Now what do I do? Because it's all already planned out. We do a lot of crockpot cooking because my children go to two different schools and I have the baby and, you know, life is crazy with three kids. So um, we do a lot of um, chicken breast in the crockpot, so a couple of cans of chilies, an onion, a couple of um, cloves of garlic, and then in a corn tortilla, or we'll use it later in the week for burritos, or we'll use it later in the week just on top of some brown rice. Um, lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, my kids are really, really good eaters. We're blessed with that. So in our house, we always serve um, a salad first, then your green vegetable, and then you can have whatever else you want. So then carbs and protein come next. Um, it ensures that they eat a lot of carbs. They eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. It also does. My, I also serve my husband and I that way. So <laughs> it's very, very disciplined. <laughs> uh, when we go out to dinner now, just the two of us, we always eat our vegetables first. Like, this is so weird. Like, you can eat whatever you want. It's funny. <laughs> I'm grown. <laughs> Totally. I'm like, you could have your steak first, babe. And he's like, no, I have to eat <laughs> all the broccoli. <laughs> so um, we do a lot of stir fries and things like those. It's just super quick because it's so often that we're rolling in at 4.30 and we eat dinner at 5. So yeah. um, I think that the key for me, um, especially with kind of sp- food specialty, you know, sensitivities and things in my house is the pre-planning. So if we're planned, we're good to go. If we're not planned, that's when you get caught and you don't make good food choices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You had mentioned crock pot and things like that. Leanne, do you have good resources of kind of your favorite places to find recipes? I do. And in fact, I think it's one of your favorite cookbooks too. Um, The Slow Cooker, the best cookbook ever. Oh yeah, that Um, one's fantastic. Love that cookbook. And um, as far as I know, last, I, I saw it at Costco recently. Um, and it is uh, written by Diane Phillips. Uh, another book I really, um, it's a new book. Um, it's called The Mom 100 Cookbook by Katie Workman. Uh, her recipes are all really pretty simple and fast. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, they may not use as many vegetables as I would like. So I just will make a, a side of um, sauteed spinach or broccoli or um, oven roasted cauliflower, which is one of our favorites. Um, And then I also like the new Mediterranean diet cookbook. Um, Great, simple, simple recipes and very, very healthy. And that book is um, written by Nancy Jenkins. Oh, cool. A a couple that I'd like to add as well, just because I think you you sparked some ideas in my head, too. There's one that we use a lot. um, This I don't know the exact name, but it has something to do with cooking superfoods. And it's actually by like Martha Stewart's living um and it's it's a really colorful pretty book i've got it too but i can't remember the author yeah exactly so that was a really good one and then we're a a gluten intolerant family and so um my favorite book which also has a website um it's called whole life nutrition i love that book. and um oh my gosh the recipes in there are so delicious they do have a decent amount of ingredients but um they're all like beans vegetables like all this kind of stuff like stuff you want to throw into a pot of stuff right um but great ideas for salads like thinking out of the boxes as well and they they just um they just wrote a brand new book too and i can't think of the name of it off the top of my head but we'll we'll post it on our website for links to these um awesome cookbooks how about you ladies anything off the top of your head that you love i can't even think of the site (laughs) totally random of course like oh yeah what is it um but what's really helpful for me is when you get to that point and you're you're in the position to plan and you don't you look at the stuff and you don't know what to do and there's sites where you can type in like Apples. Apples, <laughs> you know, walnuts and chicken. And you can get a, a recipe out of that because you don't have time to find, you know, like there's not a search little window on your cookbook for just those things. And so I like those types of sites a lot because then you're like, okay. And then I improvise as to, you know, like how else I make that up. Those are a lifesaver because sometimes you're like, you get to that point where you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I only have this, this, and this. And I'm pretty creative in the kitchen. So I'm like, okay, I'll I'll do that. And, or that'll spark an interest to get me doing something else. Cool. How about you, Lori? 
I'm a bit of a not rule follower. Cookbooks awesome. don't really work for me. Cool. I'm like, ah, you know, <laughs> the measuring is just too much. <laughs> um, so unless I'm baking, I don't really use, I don't go from a cookbook place. No, that, that's fantastic. I wish I had more of a, a niche for that. I kind of, I do improvise a little bit, but then on the spices, I get a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so when am I going to put too much But it's a drawback when you do cook like that and somebody goes, oh, how do you make that? Totally. Totally. No, no clue. Totally. No clue. <laughs> um, we were always convinced that my grandmother, when she used to pass on recipes used to leave out a couple of the ingredients so it never tasted as good as her original That's and funny. so my mom will like piece together stuff and she's like I know there's oregano in here <laughs> like she totally lied that um, is funny all right well, when we come back Leanne will discuss easy exercises to incorporate after you've had your baby and how lactic acid can affect the flavor of your breast milk we'll be right back <laughs> All right, and we're back, and our expert today is Leanne Webster, who is an owner of, uh, is the owner of 52 Healthy Weeks and a certified personal trainer, licensed well coach, and nutritional counselor. And we're talking about ways to lose weight while breastfeeding while maintaining your milk supply. So, um, Leanne, when is it safe for a mother to begin exercising after having her baby? Depends on what the doctor says, um, but if you didn't have any significant tearing or you didn't have a C-section, um, usually your doctor will give you clearance after about one, two weeks. Okay. If you've had a C-section, then uh, more often it's going to be uh, four to six weeks. Okay. And do you recommend starting out with cardio, weights, both? Um, I know you're a big fan of both. I am a big fan of both. Um, you know what, though? I would say start the first two weeks with cardio. And really just start to develop the habit. And, um, and with cardio, you mean walking? Oh, yeah. So so with cardio, I mean uh, non-weight-bearing activity um, where you may go out for a walk for about 30 minutes. You're going to be working out in your aerobic zone. So you want to be about 65 to 85% of what your maximum heart rate would be. Okay. And would when would you incorporate weights? So after you start to develop the habit and you make sure that your milk supply is not decreasing and you're, um, you know, starting to get into the rhythm of having a new baby, um, then I would start to add in weight-bearing activities. So you could add in weights. That would be great. Um, Or you could also add in things that um, would be considered weight-bearing. So it would be like squats, lunges, jumps, hops, um, uh, jumping jacks. So essentially anything you can do in your living room while your kid's taking a nap. That's actually <laughs> that's actually why I was naming those exercises because I think one of the main um, things for new mothers to remember is that you really can work out in your backyard or your home. You just have to make it a priority and you have to get creative. And um, I think the key, and I, I say this because I actually ended up doing it myself this morning. I've got a seven-year-old, seven-year-old at home. My husband went on a bike ride. I knew I needed to be here, but I needed to get that workout in. So I actually made myself a list of 10 different exercises, and I repeated the cycle three times. And um, it took about 45 minutes. I had my heart rate up there. It was all weight-bearing activity, and it actually required no equipment. That's awesome. Um, Ladies, have you found it difficult to incorporate exercise into your daily routine since you've had your kids? Yes, because I was tired. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, like, and it was really challenging because there's – in the sense that like you do have all this time but it's getting over yourself and knowing that you'll have that much more energy if you get out of the house for 30 minutes um so that was challenging but once i did it it was always great you know i eventually forced myself um i started training for a marathon when my baby was nine months and so i had to um i had to train but Specifically, we, we had group runs on Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings. So then, you know, my, there was quality time with whoever was watching the baby, and I was able to um, go. And you can get a jogging stroller. My husband offered, and I said, no, that would require me to take the baby. So <laughs> I did not do that. So that was really nice because um, I got to train for a marathon and have that time to you know, I'm actually exercising and socializing. That's great. For you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Lori? Um, I think because my older children are now in school, it's a whole lot easier. And God finally gave me a baby who likes a stroller. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how that happened. Your other two kids didn't like the stroller? No, my big kids never, like putting them in the stroller was like torturing them. So with them, it was a lot of walking and it was always on my back. 
Yeah. Um, which was great. Which was weight bearing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> right? Like, you know, no, that is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With, you know, walking a couple of miles with a, you know, 30 pound baby mm-hmm. on your back. Um, but Zoe like, loves a stroller. She's more than happy to be in the stroller. So for me, it's fantastic. The kids are in school four days a week. Zoe and I run every morning after we drop the big kids off at school. It's just part of our routine. She was able to, you know, we go, we always go to a park afterwards. Mm-hmm. She knows she's going to get to play afterwards. So for her, that works great. Where it's hard for me is yoga and weekend runs. Um, so my husband and I have gotten really good about on weekends, on Saturday and Sunday, we do family runs. So the girls sit in the double stroller. My son will ride his bike, and we'll get a family run in. Um, so th- we're working on that becoming our habit. Um, my sh- my struggles in yoga. I love yoga. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's very difficult to find a class where I can make that happen without putting Zoe in childcare, which isn't really an option for our family. So that I mean, and I th- I love that you both brought up this importance of making it part of your routine. I know Leanne, that's something you really advocate because. I am the worst <laughs> person to plan for exercise because literally everything comes ahead of it. Yet, I feel a million times better when I do it. And the fact that you've made it a family routine or Noreen, how you, you know, you said, I'm training for a marathon, so I have to do this. Like, I think that that's so significant because if it's built into it makes sense in with your family and with your time that you're more apt to do it. For me, it's like, okay, well, maybe if I don't have a client this morning, maybe I'll go to a yoga class. And then next thing I know, something comes up and I don't go. I think for me, it became a story that I would tell myself in my head. I was up all night nursing the baby. I'm so tired. Yes. And at the point that, I, that it became where I was like, well, that's an excuse. And that's not healthy for anybody. And I just did it whether I was tired or not. And if I forced it to become a habit, it was so much healthier for everybody. Yeah. I think you guys all bring up really good points. I think one one thing that really helps is accountability. Mm-hmm. So if you can get a friend who has the same schedule as you, and um, you guys can become workout partners and accountability partners, that's very helpful. Um, you brought up a really good point about training for a marathon. I uh, For a lot of people, a marathon may be a bit of a lofty goal. And then the other thing that motivates a lot of people is doing something in the cause of someone else. So whether it be the breast cancer three day or um, doing something for the Leukemia Foundation or, or, you know, nowadays you can actually create your own event and raise money for it. Um, So you may have, you know, a friend in need or, or some sort of cause or nonprofit organization, but sometimes that is what gets people to do things, um, that are outside, it's outside themselves, so they can be uncomfortable for um, someone else. That's such a good point. I, I totally did the three day last year. Yeah. And I didn't even train for it. And my mom, my mom had trained, my mom is in so much better shape than I am. I mean, she she's a personal trainer as well. She had trained for this for six months and like leading up to a week four, she's like, please tell me you have shoes. And I'm like, I have <laughs> shoes. I'm fine. I got the worst blisters of my entire life. But it's true. There's no way you could pay me to, right. work, to walk 20 miles tomorrow for just for myself yes now to the the thing with lactic acid what is the deal with lactic acid i mean what is it how does it get into our milk and does it cause breast milk to have funky flavors okay (laughs) so lactic acid is a form of acid that the body releases um the body releases it when you get to about 85 percent of your maximum heart rate so a good example of when that would happen is if somebody is doing a um a 400 meter run around a track at a very high pace. Um, 400 meters, you're gonna get some lactic acid buildup if you're going all out because you're going about 85 to 90 percent of your maximum heart rate. However, um, you're not gonna get lactic a- lactic acid buildup if you are exercising in your aerobic zone, which would be about 65 to 85 percent of your maximum heart rate. Um, so does that that yeah. answer okay so um does it make breast milk taste bitter well from all the studies that they've done uh the answer is yes it can in the women that are doing the high intensity interval training so what would you say their percentage that they're working at like over 85 percent? yes okay. yes and um so also you some people may i mean i talk about maximum heart rate as though it's just you know something i well, something I talk about every day, which it is. <laughs> but for those who don't know, 
if you have access to a personal trainer so that they can figure out your maximum heart rate based on your resting heart rate, that's ideal. But if you don't have that access, a quick formula is to just take the number 220 and subtract your age from that number. So let's say you're a 40-year-old woman. So 220 minus 40 is 180. And then you're going to take percentage 65% to 85% is your aerobic zone. And anything above 85% is is where you're going to start producing the lactic acid. Okay. Helpful? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And I mean, I, I guess it's important to say too that just because your breast milk has lactic acid in it doesn't mean that your baby won't drink it. Absolutely. And that's very true because all the studies indicate that it's it only happens with a very, very few amount of women. So you've just got to try it and see, you know, if it happens with you. And if it does, then just re- kind of reduce the amount of your essentially where you're getting your heart rate up to. Yes. So that way you're not producing it. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Cool. And um, one of our Facebook friends, Misty, had a question for you. And it was, um, that's what she said, I definitely experienced a drop in supply with any significant exercise um, that she had with her first daughter. And she was wondering how to continue to exclusively breastfeed and exercise. Okay. So what I would guess is probably going on is that she may be doing a longer bout of exercise, maybe um, 45 minutes to an hour. Maybe she's burning around um, four to 500 calories during that time. And it's very possible that she's not um, increasing the amount of food that she's eating. So it's very possible that her daily calories are dropping below 1,500. Okay. So I think the key is for her to keep, keep uh, count of her calories and make sure that she's not dropping below 1,500. And, you know, find out what her magic number is because maybe her number is 1,600. Um, Everybody has a different metabolic rate. And all of these things that I'm talking about are, you know, scientific studies that have been done for the general population. All right. Well, thank you so much, Leanne, for your insight into nutrition and losing weight while breastfeeding and maintaining your milk supply. And for our Boob Group Club members, our conversation will continue at the end of the show. And for more information about becoming a Boob Group Club member, please visit our website at theboobgroup.com. So here's a question from one of our listeners. Her name is Catherine, and she's writing from San Francisco, California. My baby girl was born about 10 weeks premature. She was in the NICU for a while, and she's home with us now. We are exclusively breastfeeding, and I'm considering getting on a regular feeding schedule as opposed to feeding on cue. I've been told premature babies don't often give the same verbal cues, such as crying, to indicate that they are hungry. What is the best way to handle this situation? Thanks. Hi, Catherine. This is Donna Rose Feinberg, an IBCLC in private practice in the Seattle area. Premature babies often need some extra help when it comes to breastfeeding. They may have started out not breastfeeding at all or breastfeeding for only a few feedings a day and had to work their way up to exclusive breastfeeding. In the NICU, babies are often kept on a regular feeding schedule, and it may be a challenge to adjust to a more unscheduled approach once you leave the hospital. Once a baby is exclusively breastfeeding and gaining well, it's fine to feed on cue. Early feeding cues include coos, rooting behavior like looking around for the breast, licking their lips, and putting their hands in their mouths. Crying is a later feeding cue, louder than the rest, and definitely harder to miss. But if you can catch the early feeding cues, you can respond right then. For many babies, by the time they leave the NICU, they're accustomed to a regular feeding schedule. They do best maintaining that schedule for a while after discharge. You may find a combination approach works well, expecting a semi-regular feeding schedule, and then watching for cues around that time. If you're concerned about your baby's feeding patterns, definitely check with your pediatrician or a local IBCLC to help you determine if your baby's growing on the right track. As long as your baby is gaining weight appropriately and having enough wet and poopy diapers, you can find the feeding pattern that works best for your baby and you. Remember, you are the expert in your own baby. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much to our experts, panelists, and to all of our listeners. If you have any questions about today's show or the topics we discussed, please call our Boob Group hotline at 619-866-4775 and we'll answer your question on an upcoming episode. If you have a breastfeeding topic you'd like to suggest, we'd love to hear it. Simply visit our website at theboobgroup.com and send us an email through the contact link. Coming up next week, we have Wendy Colson here discussing how to create a breastfeeding plan while your baby is in the NICU. Thanks for listening to The Boob Group, because mothers know breast. This has been a new Mommy Media production. 
The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.